Tonight, I want to uh, talk with you a little bit about some directions I see and um, also address some of our anxieties and fears in the life of the church with an eye toward turning uh, into the pain in order that we might find the hope in the church and in the world. As has been stated previously in one of the earlier reports from today regarding the Light the Way campaign, we have a newly refurbished mission statement and vision statement for the West Ohio Annual Conference. And it plays upon what is already in the Book of Discipline, which is the mission of every annual conference, which is to equip local churches to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The fruit of what we have been working on over a couple of years is to say, what might that look like in West Ohio in particular? And we have added to it, not in contradiction, but expanding it just so that we can live more fully into that aspiration, that hope, that vision, that mission, and that dream. And we said, we believe that that transformed world looks like a world of justice, of love, and peace that is filled with people who are growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so as you uh, can hear and see and will see more and more through all of the mediums of the annual conference, we are looking more and more to live into this mission and in this vision and to use it really as a plumb line and as a test for everything that we're engaged in, every activity, every dream, every vision, every project and every program, and to say, if we engage this, if we ask for money for this, is it going to help us more nearly fulfill the mission that has been given to every United Methodist Annual Conference, which is to equip local churches for this primary mission? And does that transformed world look like there is more justice more love, more peace, and are more people responding to the love of Jesus Christ as proclaimed in word and deed through the church? And are they choosing to live more and more of their lives in the likeness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Now against our high aspirations, there are always things that are troubling, even bedeviling to the life of the church and of any institution and of any individual. There are movements as we're trying to move out missionally into the church and into the world. There are factors that just simply represent life and the realities that challenge not only us as individuals, but us as a part of an institution called an annual conference in the United Methodist Church. And who among us in these more recent years has not spent lots of time uh, even wallowing for as hopeful as some of us may be and hearing and responding to the palpable anxiety in the church, the cries of fear, of hopelessness, of falling faint even in doing good, of discouragement, of disillusionment and disappointment. And the purpose of vision and mission is to jerk us back into a different narrative in which we substitute these words for the ones that are on the screen now, and we choose to be a people of hope, a people of courage, a people of strength, a people of vision, a people of energy, a people who have imagination, and most of all, people who are deeply grounded and growing in our faith and choosing to do it together. It goes without saying, and would be an enormous understatement, to say that our denomination is not in a period of tremendous anxiety. And while in one sense we are waiting for things to happen at the general church level, our primary work on a day-to-day, week-to-week, and month-to-month -month basis, and the place ultimately where we have the greatest opportunity to make change in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we are, to rehearse a different narrative, if you will, is in the places where we live, closer to the ground, so to speak. That's not a diss 
to the series of conferences that help to shape and define us as United Methodists, but it does say in this arena, within particular boundaries, we can choose to live with as much hope, as much courage, as much faith, as much imagination, and as much strength as we choose to. Among the things that have troubled us, of course, has been our now 45 year, and it's really closer to 50, debate about human sexuality. And our struggle in particular about how might the church live in a healing and hopeful relationship with all of God's people, including our gay and lesbian sisters and brothers who are already a part of the church and of this very assembly. To that end, the general conference and the delegates, uh, uh, we, some of them have been before you during these days, voted to ask the Council of Bishops to appoint a commission on the way forward. I want to take just a few moments to tell you about that work in which we've been engaged. It course, of course took until the fall of 2016 to get the commission named, and that's a part of the nuancing and delicacy and the complexity in a global church of trying to have a body that has some chance of looking something like the church looks in terms of nationality, in terms of the way in which people do church, in terms of people that are gay and straight, et cetera, et cetera. So that body was constituted in the late fall of this year, began meeting at near the very end of January. Between January and the first weekend in, uh, in April, there were three meetings. So people have expended themselves greatly to come to these meetings with only one resignation thus far, and that because of just too much of the press of time of other responsibilities and not the ability to calculate how much work and how much time would be involved. And the task of the commission is to bring back to the Council of Bishops and in turn the Council's responsibility will be to take that work and to bring it, we pray, in some usable and hopeful form that is forward-facing, that invites the church to discover the ways in which we might remain unified about our most slippery issue that has sought to divide us across almost 50 years. I want to report to you that the members of that commission, of which I'm one, have worked faithfully and diligently. People have spent time and invested in one another and in the process, spending time in prayer, doing deepened kind of get acquainted, studying the Bible all the way through the book of Galatians, studying a number of things like uh, the anatomy of peace from the Arbinger Institute, and we have begun to be in work groups that have worked on particular tasks. And in the next several months, it's my hope and expectation as I understand the process that there will be more forthcoming from our work that will begin to look like it has been shaped into possible pathways for the commission, the council, and the whole church to kind of chew on and to say, is there a way that we can address this dilemma for the church that maximizes the presence of the United Methodist Church in all of the places in which we find ourselves around the globe. So we've got a charge and we have a sense of mission and scope that says we want at the end of the day to carry on these conversations to deal with any proposals that may come out of the work of this commission in a way that invites the church to discover that they have already been given the gift of unity from the heart and spirit of Jesus Christ. And what are the ways in which we can find to express both that unity and to create some space for moving forward together so that we never lose sight Remember that first slide of our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm not Pollyanna about the future, but I choose to be a prisoner of hope about the future. 
and that together we will find a way. May I say to you, like many of you, on any difficult matter in my personal life or otherwise, just, just about the time I'm ready to give up on somebody or on some group or on some movement, God shows up in peculiar ways. I happen to have the privilege of serving the church in some other venues in ecumenical dialogue and have been working with um, uh, our Episcopalian sisters and brothers in a bilateral conversation that we pray will lead in due season to a full communion agreement. And we got, we, along the way, we've had several arresting points where we thought we were going to need to walk away from one another, not in a sense of anger, but in a sense we just can't get past this interpretive matter around the, real, the nature of real presence in the Eucharist or around what you should serve as wine or grape juice in the Eucharist or around, heaven forbid, the historic episcopate. And we went through a process as we began to get toward a consensus that allowed us to, com uh, to commend to the church our work in a foundational document which you've read about in recent weeks, where we moved past the place where we were viewing one another as objects that needed to be fixed and began to ask a different question about what is it that we hold sufficiently in common where we can link hearts and arms and minds to go forth to serve the world more faithfully and effectively together. Not in organic union or merger, it's not on the table, it's never been on the table in this dialogue. But is there a robustness of partnership that we might call full communion? And do we see, and this is ecumenical work at its best, in one another the signs of the fullness of what church is sufficiently to move forward in these conversations. I say to you, that is another way of looking at the work of the commission on the way forward. Do we, despite all of our differences around human sexual expression, find in one another, individually, in our camps and in our tribes, sufficient signs of the triune God at work in our respective lives to say we choose to be in co-mission together for the sake of the world that God loves so much, that God gave God's only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on Him would not perish but have everlasting life. What is essential for us to agree on in order to be church together that's called United Methodist? I don't have the answer to that. I, I have some hunches to that that are satisfying to me. I have some things that I've personally taken off the table and to say that for me as a child of God, as a baptized believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a leader in the church, that if it were up to me only, these are not deal breakers. My friends, we've got to shorten the list in all of our relationships about what are the deal breakers and decide what are the things that will hold us together. I want to say to you, this is the United Methodist way. We always begin what we with what we hold in common. If you read the discipline outside of some of the more juridical passages in the book of discipline, there's actually some exciting stuff in there. <laughs> some stuff that will not depress you or will not get you twisted about wondering about who is more Christian than somebody else. I, I didn't come to play around tonight. I love you. you you've already said you love me. <laughs> I, I, I didn't come to waste your time because I'm standing between you and a lot of ice cream. So, 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 
So I understand, and, and in the section on our theological task, we always begin, it always and has for a number of quadrinia with what we hold in common with other Christians. I caught a plane in Bloomington, Illinois some years ago when I was serving there. Uh, I think I was flying to New York for uh, an engagement and I'd come from a busy day of preaching and teaching in the life of a, a, a former conference that I served. I was not able to take off my clerical collar, which is most often how, uh, how I preach and speak, especially if I know I'm going to sweat a lot. And um, I got on the plane, I sat down in the aisle seat. It was the last flight out of Bloomington, headed into LaGuardia. I was just tired, exhausted, and I just wanted to drop my head down and go to sleep. Sat down next to a woman, as you would imagine, and after a while, when the plane took off, she started a conversation. You already know what she led with. Well, what do you do? I was just tired enough and it was just late enough that I wanted to give a Weisenheimer kind of answer. Like, do you think I'm just dressed up like this for my health? Is it Halloween, et cetera? But, but the Holy Spirit restrained me and saved me from being a jerk. As it turns out, she was a U.S. citizen, but her birth was in one of the countries of, uh, of, of, of Latin America, and she was intrigued. And so I said, I, I, I don't always lead with, I'm a bishop, because that then opens up other stuff. But I, I said, I said I'm, I'm a pastor. And uh, she said, oh yeah, what, ki what kind of pastor are you? And I, I said, I'm a United Methodist uh, pastor. And eventually she got uh, to finding out actually what my day job is. And, and, uh, and then she said, uh, I was raised uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, my mother is very devout, but um, I've not found as much meaning in it as I would like to in these years past confirmation. But she wasn't dissing it, wasn't saying she was a, uh, an unbeliever, just simply saying she had uh, kind of been distanced from the church, but wasn't blaming anyone. That's a different conversation. And then she, she said, well, tell me what's unique about United Methodists? And I discovered in that moment that I, I had actually read our theological task a time or two. And that I had been wired and nurtured and shaped as a United Methodist in this Wesleyan tradition not to begin the conversation with everything that was unique to United Methodism or to a Wesleyan approach to the Christian faith. And I said, ma'am, if you don't mind, could I begin? And I did just what the discipline does. I tell you, this is how we think. This is what's in the book. We begin at the place of saying what we have in common with all Christians. In one sense, the nuances and the distinctiveness is not nearly as important. And in fact, it doesn't even make sense if we don't begin with what we hold in common with all Christians. That's our approach to theology as United Methodists. We seek to say we hold in common with all Christians a deep faith and conviction in the triune God and that that triune God, creator and redeemer and sanctifier has been, is now, and will continue to be at work bringing new creation into this world. Oh, I, I could go on and on, but you got a lot of ice cream <laughs> to get to. What if that was our paradigm? We're such an argumentative culture an argumentative church. And if you keep arguing all the time, it, this, is, this is an editorial, you're just going to end up mean. And I've seen meanness. And I want you to know it doesn't all take place at the general conference. And it doesn't all take place here. I, I get notes from some of you in your local churches. And they are not always inspiring. I 
pastor church recently through their district superintendent. I said, go back to them and ask them, is the word forgiveness in their lexicon as a Christian community? Now I say all of this as a, a, a kind of a teasing out of the challenging, difficult work that the commission has to do. Subsequently, the general conference will have to do it, the council of bishops will have to do it. But what an opportunity to reposition ourselves and rename the terms of the conversation so that, as some of us have been learning and many of you have known it, that we can come to every relationship, every engagement, individual, one-on-one, -on -one, group, and otherwise, with a heart of peace rather than a heart that is filled with animosity. On the slides with the words that were going wicky-wacky, you saw one of the words that we needed to put in the place of something to be deleted was courage. The courage to move beyond our fears of what might really be possible for us if we came to this conversation and we had a different template in our heads. In the book of Deuteronomy at 31 and 6 and in Joshua 1 and 9, almost identical words. And I want to acknowledge parenthetically, though not unimportantly, I get that if you read deeply into these texts, particularly the Joshua text, there are some things with which people of faith and the triune God need to wrestle about inheriting the promises as the result of the obliteration of other people. But I'm coming to that in a minute. But I want to just raise these words off of the page for you that say in Deuteronomy, be strong and bold, have no fear or dread of them because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. And then the Joshua text, I hereby command you. Now that's, that's pretty strong. I command you. This is to fearful people that are on the edge of something new. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What if in the engagement of this difficult and challenging conversation about human sexual expression or anything else, and it might even come up tonight. We were the people, we were the church, we, West Ohio, were the conference that says, you know, we're just about to wave some colored flag, and we're about to throw in the towel, because we don't know if we can hang to it together anymore, but could it be that we're right on the edge. We're in a long advent. Oh, I wish somebody would pray with me tonight. And if we just hold on long enough, light is gonna break forth through the darkness. <laughs> birth, something new will be birthed. And I don't wanna miss the newness that God just might be trying to work in the United Methodist Church and in the West Ohio Annual Conference. But because we're already fearful and anxious, we've got to hear the voice of the Holy One say to us, be courageous, move forward without fear. And this is the word, it's resembling of what's at the 28th chapter at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel. But here in Deuteronomy, here in Joshua, in many other places in Scripture, as you go, go in the assurance that I go with you. I go with you. Some of you who have emailed me and gotten a direct email back from me, and by the way, I'm not inviting uh, any pen pals. I, uh, I, I, I love you, but um, um, you know, our IT people say, uh, Bishop, we have to keep expanding your gigabytes because uh, you never clean out anything. So I, I don't want to be the cause of our system crashing. But at the bottom of my email, as a kind of a signature, 
I've had for several years, maybe, maybe as much as three, but for sure two. A quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I want to read it to you, and it'll pop up on the screen shortly. He says, Christianity stands or falls with its revolutionary protest against violence, arbitrariness, and pride of power. And with its plea for the weak. I, I, that's so good, I, I want to read it again. And then he goes on to say, Christians are doing too little to make these points clear rather than too much. He continues, Christendom adjusts itself far too easily to the worship of power. And he concludes this little quote, which was a part of a larger body. Christians should give more offense, should shock the world far more than they are doing right now. I just want to let that settle in. The formerly mainline institutional church has spent so much time trying to blend in with the culture that it could be that the salt has lost its savor. It's no bad people, it's just like you kind of drift into that. It is when we are preoccupied with our entitlements, our prerogatives, and our privileges. More than we're preoccupied with the world to which the Father sent the Son. So I wish you could hear, Dietrich, we stand or fall with our revolutionary protest against violence, arbitrariness, and pride of power. And with our plea, or may I say or not, for the weak. We're doing far too little to make this clear, rather than far too much. And so in the same way that I want you to come with courage, and I, I'll be out for some difficult conversations with some helpers, in the fall. I've not yet dreamed or imagined the logistics of that, but I want us to step into these conversations. But there's also some other things about which we've got great clarity in the scriptures, in the best history of the church, and in our book of discipline and resolutions. And I want us in this particular age to grow the kind of courage to speak for the most vulnerable in our culture. I want to give you some love and pat you on the back and give you all the high fives, thumbs up, and kudos that I can. And I was moved beyond belief this day when we saw the little video about All In Community. And I remember three years or more ago when I asked, would you step up? Could you see that you could take that little business out of Matthew 25 and find somewhere on the spectrum of incarceration, somebody affected by it that you could engage personally and that your congregation could. And I want to say to you, you, in your churches, in your settings, in your discipleship, you have been magnificent and over the top. And Lisa's story that we saw on video today and what she's done because the Whitehall Church said, there's room for you here. We've got a gospel of forgiveness, a gospel of hope, and a gospel of healing made it possible for her to claim a life that she thought had passed her by or that she had relinquished because of her previous behaviors and what she would view as failures and shortcomings. So in this world where we're in a huge dust-up about how are we to be in relationship with our neighbors, we argue and fuss over immigration policy, we can't find our voice in such profound ways that sometimes we even attack people whose skin is olive, whose first language may not be English, 
but who were born in this nation. What would it look like keeping Bonhoeffer to speak nothing of Jesus in mind? If we took all of the initiative that we could in all the places that we live to say, we intend by God's grace to be a welcoming and hospitable presence to all of our neighbors. All of our neighbors. Not just those that look like us, walk like us, talk like us, have education and income like us, Accents are like our accents. What if we took that seriously and responded to the question long ago that was turned back on that inquiring mind and that said to the master, and just who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And it of course was the one who responded with mercy, with healing, with compassion, and with embrace. We are called, and I want to invite you into an initiative where we are engaged robustly in the welcoming of our neighbor in our communities, urban, town, and rural, and where we engage based upon what we United Methodists have said through our discipline and our book of resolutions and social principles about immigration in this nation. We've got to stop fooling around with this. We have the genius in this room, and it would be true in other, every other annual conference, to find a way at the ground level and also at the level of public policy in state houses, in local councils, and in the Congress and the White House of these United States. I've thrived on my trips to our mission partner in the Democratic Republic of Congo, our friend Bishop Ntambo, our friend now, of course, Bishop Monday, as we've gone to visit the North Katanga Episcopal area. And what a leader Bishop Ntambo has been. We all know that his accolades are too many, and I expect nothing but a similar kind of outreaching leadership on the part of our friend and brother Bishop Monday, who will begin his first series of annual conferences on Wednesday of this week, and we've already invited you to prayer. But on the times that I have been there, one of the things that has moved me beyond belief is that in services of worship for the annual conference and for the Congo Central Conference, where in March of this year, we were consecrating three new bishops of the United Methodist Church. There was an imam, a Muslim imam, who came to be a part of that worship service, not to offer the liturgy. There he is on the screen, sitting next to Bishop Katimbo. And I said, this is the world that we've dreamed of. This is a different narrative than all of the Muslims around us must surely be terrorists. Seriously? These are in Christian United Methodist services of worship where the outreach of the United Methodist Church had been so meaningful, so powerful, so profound. There was such respect for the retiring bishop that as new bishops were being consecrated, other religious leaders of other faith traditions came to that service came and come to the annual conference. Maybe in this partnership with our global partners, we've got far more to learn than we think we have. We are not only the deliverers of mission, we need to be the recipients of mission. We not only have resources to give, we got resources to receive about how you build that kind of commissioning. And it was natural, it was natural I've been there to their annual conference in Kamina when an entourage of imams and their spouses have come in for the service of worship at the annual conference. And I thought 
In all the places where I've lived and served, I've been involved in ecumenical and interfaith dialogue, have even shared it in some places, but I don't know that I had that many people from other faith traditions who would come to a high and holy service such as the consecration of a bishop. How many Muslim neighbors feel so welcomed by you and your church that they might just drop in. I know of a couple congregations, Forest Chapel congregation in Cincinnati in the ORV has a little delegation of Nepalese sisters and brothers who do not profess the name of Jesus, but they come in and sit on the back row because Pastor Kabamba has said, you are welcome in this place. When I said embracing our neighbors, I'm serious <laughs> about embracing our neighbors and not choosing to see the walls or fences that have dominated us so much before. One final word on this initiative to welcome all of our neighbors. I'm wearing a pin under my Episcopal pin. It's a dove with an olive branch. It was a gift. I received it today. I didn't know it was coming, but I had seen and admired someone else's. And it was a reminder from a member of the Armstrong Chapel Church in Cincinnati and of a delegation of members of this conference who came to visit with me to talk about how together we might more robustly stir the conversation about the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and choose to put on the lenses that allow us to see enough room for both and our call to see them in global community as our neighbors and our coaching encouragement of them to choose to be healthy neighbors to one another. Where what for some in that area look like security fences through the eyes of our Palestinian sisters and brothers looking at those fences around the settlements, they see them as apartheid fences. What does it mean to live with our neighbors and will we find a way to stand with both? <laughs> One of the things that I have rejoiced in is in my trips to the Holy Land, spending increasing time in Palestinian territory and on the West Bank. And I want to encourage all of you that if you have the opportunity, whether with me or another group, to go to the Holy Land, to find ways to spend time with both Jewish and Palestinian sisters and brothers who may be Muslim or Christian, and many, many Christians, and discover and learn from both their stories. Place it in the context of an ancient story, and to say, how might we live in to a new story together in the 21st century where we come toward one another with a heart of peace? I beg of you to join that conversation and to see on this screen what all of us have seen in our neighborhoods, which is not an especially religiously motivated sign, but I simply have seen it so much around that I could not help but share it with you, even though I know you've seen it. In several languages, but in the center in English, signs in yards that say no matter where you're from, we are glad you are our neighbor. Now thirdly, we have been a leader in this annual conference in the Global Health Initiative. There's been a kind of a tweaking of the language and now we're beginning to embrace and um, as one of our four foci the, the, the framework of abundant health and abundant health for all. And there are several things that I'm going to be working with appropriate leaders, staff, and you all on getting going in the life of this annual conference, and some of it is underway. 
I want you to partner under the rubric of our social principles, our book of resolutions, and the convictions expressed in our discipline in helping those who cannot yet find a healing and redemptive way to see that our conviction as United Methodists, that health care ought to have access, and that means not just that it's there, but that it's financially accessible for all. Abundant health for all. These are interconnected. The second thing, and this is all under abundant health, we have a mess on our hands with the opioid crisis. You know those stories. I've been to some of your places. I've talked to pastors who have said to me straightway, I serve in a suburban community. I've buried four or five young people from opioid overdose, her black tar heroin overdoses. People want the ministry of the church. They let me bury their child. But in the church at large, they don't want to talk about it. May I say to you, it isn't going to go away by our not talking about it. It's not going to get better because we don't talk about it. we got to step to this thing. It is affecting people of all classes. And this morning I heard a story that broke my heart from Dayton Children's Hospital from Pastor Darrell Fairchild who said that an adult who had the black tar heroin in a kind of a gummy bear candy form, a one-year-old got a hold of it. And I inevitably asked the question, did the child survive? Pastor Darrell dropped his head and said no. Will we work to have abundant help for all? Will we deal with addiction? <laughs> Will we remind people that they are forgiven for people that have already lost loved ones to this or their lives are in an uproar? Will we have a place for them where they can work through this and work out their soul's salvation? What is an epidemic is soon in my judgment to be a pandemic. Will the United Methodist Church, and the only place where we've got influence really, friends, is West Ohio. Will our 1,020 congregations step into that conversation of abundant health? Oh, I'm not done yet. I'm still on abundant health. Will we have the moral courage in our communities and in this nation without specific blame to particular groupings and tribes to say that gun violence is a public health crisis in America? I remind you that we serve the Prince of Peace and we have declared that he is Lord of all. Either he is or he isn't. But the test is, will we live like he is Lord of our lives? And the fourth matter under abundant health that we will be coming toward across this next year, and I'll launch a task force on the last Monday of June, is on clergy wellness in our annual conference in all of its dimensions, physical, spiritual, financial, and emotional. I look to have a good report that will come to you about ways we can step into the challenge and the opportunity, but also to say to you that everything we can do that doesn't require a vote, we ought to get at it as soon as we can. Now finally, friends, so that you can get to the ice cream. Maybe I'll have some tonight. And uh, You heard a wonderful presentation this morning. We'll have a worship service focused on it tomorrow around the Light the Way campaign. And that campaign, as you've heard, is focused on raising some of the capital that will be needed. And it's only a part of it. To resource the planting and we pray the multiplication of new congregations, worshiping and faith communities, and to strategically engage in our best opportunities to redevelop other congregations that already exist, 
by investing in them dramatically in such ways that they can move into the next cycle of their lives. I um, have sometimes been inspired and often troubled, and only troubled because it's so true, by the great bishop and missiologist Leslie Newbigin. He says, and it's on the screen, spiritual renewal will only happen when local congregations renounce an introverted concern for their own life and recognize that they exist for the sake of those who are not members as a sign, as an instrument, and as a foretaste, oh my God, of God's redeeming grace for the whole of life and society. My friends, in a profound way, church is not just about us. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the sovereign God, did not call this movement and enterprise into being just so we could get together in a few tabernacles scattered across the landscape to become a mutual admiration society. I mean, we are admirable, but But we've been brought together to go out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to give away what we have received as a gift. Not, not because we're more holy or more pious, but because the gift is so wonderful, it's the pearl of precious price. We wouldn't think of locking it up inside of a wood clap or brick or a steel or a glass or a concrete, concrete precinct. So we could come in and admire the pearl of precious price every seven days. This gospel is too good to be pinned up in your church building and pinned up in you. There was a Episcopal priest of some age and he had done some other things, had a PhD and he uh, would take some uh, courses uh, by audit at the Divinity School at Duke during my years. And uh, there would be some others who were in that class and one of the other older um, auditing students would kind of get up at the right time. This was not a part of the academic curriculum. But he would start singing a song. And he'd just start in and say, he'll do the same for you. 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 The same for you. And then he'd rock back and say, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. It was his testimony of saying this gospel that I've got. He cried out like Jeremiah, it's like a fire that's been shut up in my bones. And, and Jeremiah, you will recall, said, I, I have tried to stop speaking the word of the Lord. In fact, God and God's word, in effect, he said, you just have kind of gotten on my last nerve. That's my paraphrase, y'all. <laughs> and he said, but try as I might, I can't help it because it's like a fire. Shut up in my book. I don't know if you've ever felt a fire on the inside, but if you have, it'll make you want to run and make you want to jump and make you want to shout and make you want to tell somebody about the fire on the inside. 
Would you join me? I, I, I need help on this. I mean, truth be told, I spend almost all my time with church folks. And I love church folks. I love the church. But New Begin is messing with me. Bonhoeffer is messing with me. Jesus is messing with me. Go ye into all the world. Didn't you hear Doug Johns almost hoop this afternoon? And said, ye shall be my witnesses. So what I want to say is I need you, friends, to get with this campaign, but I want to assure you, it will only provide a seeding of all of the capital that will be needed. But here's what I want to do. I don't want you to wait till we get $5 million. I want you to go back and have a conversation in your local church. And I don't care how small you are, I'm just, I'm just kind of stuck on stupid. I believe any church that truly seeks to be the church and bears the mark of church, one holy Catholic, and watch this, apostolic, apostolic can grow from where it is. It's not always numbers, but I tell you, if there's enough growth in grace, somebody will come to see what this thing is that you're talking about in all the places where you live. Let me say it another way. Will we love this world and its people as much as God in Christ has loved it? Or will we spend all of our time trying to keep 1,020 churches open in West Ohio to stay the same way they are, just waiting till we can bury Mama? Now, I ain't mad at Mama. Papa, auntie, or uncle. But what I want to say is, keeping it open to do that is sweet. But it is not a mission from on high. It's not a mission from on high. You, you, you can't convince me that that's what Jesus had in mind. And so in your church, however small or however large, let's keep the main thing the main thing. The current Archbishop of Canterbury, and I'm, I'm coming to a close. I've got a taste for some black cherry ice cream. <laughs> Justin Welby said in an endowed lecture that he gave uh, somewhere in the last few years that the church exists for these two reasons to glorify God in Jesus Christ and to make new disciples of Jesus Christ, period. Hard stop, as you've heard me say. He goes on to say, after that hard stop, he offers this editorial, but not other, uh, not, not, not unimportant. And he says, everything else is decoration. Glorify God in Jesus Christ. Make new disciples. I just want that to sink in. Everything else, it's a bold statement. Everything else is decoration. He puts that English twang on it. He says, it may be quite lovely decoration. <laughs> but it's decoration none the less. Perhaps the thing that we need to be most least fearful about and most courageous is the courage to actually be the church that Dr. Brian Stone of Boston University School of Theology says in his work on evangelization that the church is God's strategy for evangelism. So tonight, Will you think about being church? Will you think about stepping in to speak for those who can't speak for themselves? Will you think about uttering the name of Jesus 
When people speak to you of their lostness, their loneliness, and would you do it not just with your words, but with your sense of community and incarnation? I'm confident that the God who said in Christ, I will be with you even to the close of the age, will keep God's promise to us. And so I end with this hymn, How to Reach the Masses, Those of Every Birth. For an answer, Jesus gave the key. He said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw everybody unto me. He went, the writer goes on to say, the world is hungry for living bread, not, not stale toast, living bread. Lift the Savior up for them to see. Trust him. Do not doubt the words that he said. I'll draw. I'll draw all men, all women, all boys, all girls unto me all oh, don't exalt the preacher and don't exalt the pew preach the gospel simple pure and free and you will find west ohio that the promise is true he'll draw he'll draw he'll draw everybody unto himself in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost amen Thank you, thank you. You, you are sweet beyond my believing, thank you. And you'll be hearing more because this is a go and do proposition. I don't know, how are we closing out, friend? You, you, you're our leader, Doc. Come on in. Let's, so rest on your feet, and we got all the help we need. Thank you.
before. <laughs> so before you are released for ice cream, let us pray. Let us give thanks for this day, for the joys of fellowship and the renewal of friendship. For words that comfort and words that challenge. For life and breath and grace. Gracious God, grant us a peaceful night Forgive us for what we have done today and what we ought not to have done, and for what we did not do today and that we ought to have done. Assist us to forgive where we have been wrong and refresh us with sleep. Be present with those who keep watch over us this night in the hospitals, the fire station, and on the streets of our cities and towns. Bless all our beloved ones. Comfort the sick and the grieving. Encourage the fearful. And strengthen the weak. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Go in peace.